All right. Well, let's let's get right to the uh, the, the subjecting everybody's psyches uh, to uh, to these uh, these clips. Uh, and yes, the fact that I was able to uh, abuse my power as a boss to force Forrest to watch so much Jordan Peterson over the course of the last week to uh, to harvest these clips is probably an argument against capitalism in itself. Uh, but let's uh, let's watch this first one. It's kind of Organization a is the rule among animals that live somewhat socially and even those who don't that occupy the same geographical territory. There has to be some way of organizing access to relatively scarce resources that doesn't result in chronic combat. Because chronic combat, well look, you're Ren A and you're Ren B and you decide to have it out so you peck yourselves half to death. And you're Ren C and so you got a little bit more patience. You just wait until those two Rens beat each other to death and then you move in. It's like it's a stupid solution. It doesn't even work for wrens, let alone people. And so, you know, the wrens announce their prowess, and they do that with the quality of their song and their displays, and, and they, they indicate to one another who shouldn't be messed with, and then there's a minimum of combat. And you could make a pretty good case that that's power, that that's power. But like, it's not like wrens get together and build like wren apartment houses and then, and then go out on collective worm hunt, insects, I guess, collective insect hunting expeditions and bring them all back and distribute them and, or, 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 or make insect farms so that there's more insects for all the wrens. They haven't got that far, you know. They're competing in a zero-sum game. And that isn't what human beings do. We figured out how to not have zero-sum games a very, very long time ago. And it turns out that if the game you're playing isn't zero-sum, right, it, it, which means that there's only a finite number of resources and everybody has to fight to the death for them, and some are going to get the lion's share and others are going to starve, if you're not playing a zero-sum game, then you can learn to cooperate and compete in an intelligent, civilized manner, and all of a sudden, there's more than enough for everyone. Now, still, some people are going to have more than other, others, you know, and, but there's nothing. To, how are you going to stop that? And do you want to? Like, do you want to only know what, do you, do you want to only be allowed to know what everyone else knows? You don't get to know anything that, no one, that anyone else knows, because it's got to be equal. You want everyone to be exactly the same amount of attractive. You know, which, and if you averaged attractiveness overall and you only allowed each person to be as attractive as the average person, there'd be not much attractiveness left in the world. And it seems to me that that would be quite the loss, you know. And strength, you're not allowed to have any additional strength or, 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 or ambition or talent or, or, ac or, or, let's say, athletic ability. It's like, or artistic ability. I mean, aren't we kind of happy that there's massive inequality in the distribution of talent i know it's it's i know it's harsh and hard but you you can't expect everybody to have every talent that there is and it would be a hell of a sacrifice if no one got to have any talent because it wouldn't be fair and so i don't get the whole equality of outcome thing it it, it isn't it isn't going to work there aren't that many geniuses you know we want to exploit the geniuses and get them to work for us and if the, if, the, if the price is is that somebody has more than you do of something, well, suck it up for Christ's sake. Well, Jesus, seriously, man. It's like, look, how much more do you have than most people have? You know, you, you, need, th you need to make $30,000 a year to be in the top 1% of the socioeconomic distribution worldwide. You know, you always hear about the 1% right, of the evil 1%. And they churn, by the way, because it's not the same people all the time. It's like all of you here are in the evil 1%, and you think, well, that's not very fair because I was really only talking about within my country. My, well, that's convenient for you, you know. Or it, it makes it really, really convenient argument for you. It's like, well, all those other people, those foreigners, they don't count. If they're poor, who the hell cares? It's, 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 it's the Australians that matter. You know, and so, no, that's, that's, that's a non-starter, you know, and, and by historical standards, you're doing a hell of a lot better than the top 1%, I can tell you that. I read a nice article by 
a, a, a coalition called Human Progress the other day, and they were comparing the typical middle-class person who lives now with uh, Rockefellers in the 19, 1919s and say, well, would you rather be a middle-class person now or Nelson Rockefeller in 1919? And the answer seemed pretty damn clear that, well, you know, if you were Nelson Rockefeller, then you would have been richer than anyone else. And there's something to be said for that status, right? Because people do like to have more than others. It's a, it's a, I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but it is one of the things that we like. And so you'd have that. You'd be richer than everyone else. But there'd be all sorts of things that you have that now that Nelson Rockefeller wouldn't have had a hope of purchasing, like the antibiotics that he would have needed to stop his son from dying, for example. You know, just as a start. And so, so I think this, 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 this complaint about inequality, look, no one likes inequality exactly. You walk down the street, this is why I always get a kick out of people who protest. Uh, I'm against poverty. It's like, really? You're against poverty. And, and you think that's a unique enough attribute so that it was worth your time to make a sign that said that you were against poverty and show other people. It's like, I've never met, I've never met anyone that was for poverty. You know, you walk down the street with someone who's pretty well off, you know, and they've got 1920s spats on and a bowler, and they're feeling pretty damn rich, and the stockster certificate sticking out of their back pocket, and, you know, there's a homeless person there, and they give them a good kick, and they say, the more poverty, the better. It's like, no. You know, when people walk down the street and you see homeless people, and they're often, homelessness is a complex problem. Like, you think, well, homeless people are poor. It's like, yeah, yeah, man. That's like one problem they have out of 50. And like I've worked with poor people, you know, in my clinical practice and poor in multiple dimensions. And many of them, you gave them money, they were just done. Especially if they were like alcoholics and cocaine addicts. As long as they were broke, they had some hope of living through the next month. But as soon as their unemployment check showed up, man, they were face down in the ditch three days later, right? Nothing but cocaine and alcohol with all their idiot friends for three days. And then they'd show up back in my practice saying, you know, God, I relapsed again. I said, well, what happened? Well, my money came in. It's like, yeah, money's really going to do you a hell of a lot of good. It just kill you faster than poverty. Now, not that there's anything good about poverty, but it's not like these are simple problems. You, know, you walk down the street and you see someone who's been an alcoholic for 20 years and maybe they're addicted to methamphetamines as well, or maybe they're schizophrenic. It's like it isn't an equal distribution of monetary resources that are, is the primary cause for that problem, and it isn't going to be some sort of straightforward redistribution that's going to fix it, because it's way more complicated than that. Hi, everyone. As some of you may know, but others will not, it's been a long while since I put up any new content on this YouTube channel. I've been suffering from impaired health, severely impaired health, as a consequence of benzodiazepine use for anxiety or more accurately from a combination of using that medication and then ceasing its use once I realized it was dangerous. Um, that's put me in and out of hospitals for much of the last year in Connecticut, in the United States, in Toronto, in Canada, in Moscow, in Russia and in Belgrade, Serbia, as my family searched for specialists who could aid me in the severe post-use withdrawal and neurological damage-related consequences of both the benzodiazepine use and, and its cessation. Um, I started taking it in 2016, 2017, early 2017, according to the prescribed um, recommendations, and really never give it a second thought. Uh, that was a mistake, uh, to say the least. Here's, here's another representation. This is a cool one. 
I've got a couple of them here that are really cool. This is from China. So this is so this is Foxy and Nuwa. I think I've got that right. But I, I just love that representation. It's so insanely cool, this representation. So you see the sort of the primary mother and father of humanity emerging from this underlying snake-like entity with its tails tangled together. I think that's a rep I really do believe this, although it's very complicated to explain why. I really believe that's a representation of DNA. So, and that, that representation, that entwined double helix, that is everywhere. You can see it in, in Australian Aboriginal art. And I'm using the Australians as an example because they were isolated in Australia for like 50,000 years. They're the most archaic people that were ever discovered. And they have clear representations of these double helix structures in their art. So, and those are the two giant serpents out of which the world is made, roughly speak. Okay. It's the same thing you see that in the staff of Asclepius, which is the healing symbol that, that physicians use, although usually that's only one snake, but sometimes it's two. So, so, so that's, a, that's a Chinese representation. And then there's, a, there's this. That's the Egyptian representation. We talked about the Egyptian story the other day, right? We talked about... Isis and Osiris. Yeah, so uh, that's that's a that's a good uh, cross section of uh, of what Peterson has been up to in uh, over the course of the last few years. Uh, if you know people are watching this on YouTube, there's a uh, there's there's a moment that I, I you can see me. I was muted, but started cracking up at a sort of odd and inappropriate moment. That's because. Uh, uh, Forrest uh, messaged me. Uh, we were on the edge of the Australian bush when the benzo started to kick in, uh, but um, but I, I think the I think that cross section of clips, you know, gives you both a uh, a good sense of the um, you know the very odd. Well, I mean, there's a lot going on there, but maybe we can start here, right? So that the uh, that you see the political upshot of of peterson's uh shtick and you know and, and this is i know a lot of people you know kind of have the you know attention span of a mosquito and they say well you know why why even talking about jordan peterson like this this guy's yesterday's news even though you know um beyond order hasn't you know 12 more rules for life hasn't come out yet and uh comes out in two days and uh the original 12 rules for life still sells like you know, two, 200 trillion copies a week in a slight exaggeration, but you know, not much, you know, check out Amazon's lists of, uh, you know, most read and, uh, and bought books of that week. Uh, and, and so he's, he's incredibly influential. I mean, even if it, it seems, uh, you know, odd to us that he might, he is, and, you know, you see the political upshot of what he's saying in the, the first clip, when he's talking about hierarchy, he's doing this, this weird, straw man thing about how people who object to inequality are like objecting to inequality and in, in strength or talent or physical attractiveness or that's that's sort of the same question as as inequality in uh, in material resources uh and uh and you see this sort of odd mystical guru way that he justifies that stance all the stuff about you know animals and um and then at the uh, at the end there, I mean, like that's that's I mean, it's kind of a remarkable thing that this is a uh, this is a root. This is like a room full of adults who uh, he just told that the uh, twine snake artwork, like symbolism in ancient artwork, is uh, a representation of the double helix structure of DNA, which was not discovered until the mid twentieth century, and nobody laughs. Like, 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 like every, everybody just treats that as, as if he just, he just said something, um, he just said something normal. So, uh, there's a lot going on here. It's a perfect panel to break it down. Um, Matt, you want to get us started? Any thoughts? Sure. Well, I have a lot of thoughts. Uh, I think I'm just going to focus on the first clip for now. Um, and I just do want to say that, uh, I do hope he's get better. He gets better on. I'm happy. He does seem to be doing better. Uh, nobody should hold uh, addiction against anyone else, uh, and that includes Jordan Peterson, right? No, uh, we, oh. we, we, we should all have the we should all have the compassion towards his struggles with addiction that he so manifestly fails right. to have at the end of the first clip towards everybody else's struggles with addiction. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Uh, so 
One of the things that's emblematic of modernity, right, is the commitment uh, in a principled way to the ideals of moral equality and freedom. And the two are fundamentally related in the sense that once you believe that people are moral equals, you think that there's something deeply wrong about using the state or imposing coercion to force someone to adopt your vision of the good life, right? And we can have debates about how these principles are supposed to be cashed out, uh, but they've proven extremely popular and have had a long shelf life. Let's just put it that way, right? Uh, one of the things that's characterized conservative thought has been resistance to both of them, uh, particularly the first principle of moral equality, but also the second principle uh, around freedom, uh, as long as freedom's not exercised in exactly the right way. Uh, and you've seen a lot of different reactionaries try to mount various different defenses of hierarchialization, stratification, uh, and authoritarianism. Uh, some of those are quite innovative, but they usually tend to take two forms, right? Uh, and this is well known. Uh, one form is mythologization, uh, which is oddly enough usually associated with a kind of skeptical kind of reasoning, right? Uh, we can't know the universe, it's too big and too impossible to understand. Uh, only God can fully understand it, but uh, this is why we shouldn't question the way things are, including established hierarchies, right? Uh, the other kind of way that this is typically justified is through naturalization, as is well known, right? Uh, which is what you also saw him do, right? Uh, in the animal kingdom, we see that bigger apes mess up smaller apes, uh, this goes to prove that this is just the way of things. Science demonstrates it. Facts don't care about your feelings. Ergo, we're always going to have hierarchies, right? Uh, and I think that there's a certain amount of truth to some of these descriptive observations, right? I mean, sure, fair enough. You can say that there are certain hierarchies that exist in the animal kingdom. Uh, you can also say that certain kind of hierarchies are useful in human social life, right? Uh, but all of this is really straw manning the modernist commitment uh, to moral equality and freedom, uh, since of course no one denies that you're gonna need hierarchies of a certain sort, right? Uh, parents will certain sense need to have a certain degree of control over their children. Uh, if we're playing a board game and I happen to be winning, uh, that's not because I'm oppressing you in any way, shape or form, it's just because we're engaging in a voluntary activity and I happen to be doing somewhat better at this. Uh, the question has always been what kind of hierarchies can be justified, right? Uh, and this is where I think he really falls off the rails a lot, uh, since he tends to not even really argue for, but just imply uh, that contemporary inequality as it stands right now is somehow justifiable because either it's mythologically necessary or naturally inevitable. Uh, and I think that that's completely bogus, right? Uh, I don't see any particularly compelling reason why it is that Jeff Bezos uh, needs to be worth $200 million. Uh, and at the same time, he has to be running a charity uh, where people can donate for his workers uh, because apparently they're not able to earn enough in between, you know, using their piss jugs uh, in order to put food on their table, right? There's absolutely nothing that's natural, inevitable, or mythologically necessary about that. Yeah, right? and, and I do want to just just underline one thing you said before we let- 200 billion, by the way, 200 billion. 200 billion, 200 billion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, which actually he's, um, because his business picked up so much at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, because everybody was using Amazon more, uh, it's going to be several years you know, before he gets there, if he does. But, you know, last summer there were stories that came out in the business press saying that he is on track uh, in the next several years to become the world's first trillionaire. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, for now he has to make do with the $200 billion. Yeah, it's a modest accomplishment, right? And <laughs> yeah, yeah. just long story short, like I just wanted to finish by saying, you know, yeah. uh, like all conservatives, um, reactionaries, those of us who are committed to the principles of modernity, freedom and equality, uh, should try to pick holes in their argument. Uh, and I think that Peterson is a pretty decent conservative intellectual, right, as they stand. And I spent a lot of time reading these people. Uh, he's certainly not up there, I would think, with somebody like Edmund Burke or um, even, you know, a darker thinker uh, like Friedrich Nietzsche uh, or Martin Heidegger. Uh, but this kind of mythologization, naturalistic synthesis he's put forward doesn't make a lot of coherent sense, uh, but it has a shelf life because it appeals to a lot of people's intuitions. And one of the reasons I think it was important for us to produce the book was precisely to offer a substantial intellectual rebuttal uh, to the kind of arguments he was put forward. Uh, yeah, whether it's done yeah. that, I don't know, but I think we did a good, a good job. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, I, if I do say so myself, but I have, uh, but I, I did just want to underline what you said about the nationaliz naturalization mythology. They said, uh, because if if anybody um, you know for anybody who's reading this for who's uh, listening or to this or watching it on YouTube who uh, who hasn't uh, read this uh, I would uh, I think an absolutely essential uh, book about um, everything that you're you're saying right now Matt uh, you know that that actually came out exactly the same time ours did uh, was Michael Brooks's uh, Against the Web and uh, that's yeah. one of the big organizing themes of the book that uh, he talks about how 
you know, well, reactionaries in general, although he's talking about the intellectual dark web in particular, uh, tend to use these these two big strategies. They they either uh, naturalize or mythologize uh, existing hierarchies. Uh, so naturalizing them, you know, this this is the the Sam Harris lane, or really in, in a more extreme way, the Charles Murray lane. Mm -hmm. uh, where yeah, you, much more extreme in his case. Yeah, although you know Harris has somewhat defended that, but yeah. Uh, but um, that uh, where you say that, uh, well, science tells us that we have to have uh, these, these hierarchies or they can't be overcome or whatever. And uh, mythologizing uh, is, you know, I mean, it's what um, Marx is reacting to in the introduction of the critique, the philosophy of right, when, you know, he has that famous passage about the opium of the people, uh, you know, which is uh, saying, oh, we have to have... So, you know, the existing social hierarchies because, you know, the gods have ordained it or, you know, something like that. You know, very different versions of that in different societies that have existed at different times. And one of the things that makes Peterson's, you know, sort of perversely interesting as kind of a reactionary is that he just slides back and forth, like almost like, um, you know, seamlessly between the two modes. You know, he, he just he just does lots of both of these things all the time. Half the time he's appealing to science. Half the time he's saying that, you know, we need, um, you know, we need to have, uh, you know, we, we can't try to redistribute wealth because then we'll be letting the dragon of chaos into, you know, to, to disrupt, uh, you know, the, um, you know, to disrupt the principles of order. Uh, but Marion, Conrad, thoughts? I can, uh, I can jump in there. Um, yeah, I thought some of your comments were interesting. I mean, it occurred to me that in Peterson's talk, there was a tension when he talked about inequality between two views, right? And one of those, which is very characteristic Peterson, um, is the idea that, um, you know, these these, these, inequ uh, these inequalities which prevail in nature, I don't even know what a wren is. I actually don't know what animal that bird. is. So someone, it's a bird, okay. Um, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't matter too much anyway. Um, there are these inequalities which prevail uh, in nature. But on the other hand, he said something else, which is interesting. He said that, um, but, you know, we're not in a zero sum game anymore. Right. And what he alluded to was, you know, society uh, having the capacity to produce resources well in excess of what nature can provide. Right. Um, so he's talking about, you know, the the increasing of productivity and, and the generation of wealth. And I think it's very interesting because he already draws a connection in that talk between, um, you know, elusively between uh, inequality and the capacity to go beyond the zero sum game, right? So I think I think the, the, an interesting question to ask would be why is it the case, right? You know that this tremendous uh, uh, you know increase in productivity, which has defined modernity and industry and so forth, why has it uh, led to such a high degree uh, of inequality, right? And I think what you have to say is that yes, on one side. Right. We can say that, you know, the great achievement of capitalism is that, you know, it's it's led to greater productivity than ever before. Not that that hasn't had consequences. Right. Look at the environmental crisis, for example, but that the way that it's been done right through, uh, you know, essentially the exploitation of wage labor, um, you know, tendentially creates greater stratifications. I think it's safe to say than than, you know, comparable precedents in the natural world. But that's not a tension that's really addressed. Uh, in his talk. In fact, as regards inequality in general, it's interesting, right? Because um, you were talking about straw manning, right? You know, Marx says in the Paris manuscripts, he says very explicitly that, uh, you know, the problem uh, with capitalism is that it doesn't permit, uh, you know, the expression of uh, the virtues of individuals, right? Or it, it, it obscures them, right? Obfuscates them, right? He says, you know, I'm ugly, but I can have the most, you know, the most beautiful wife, right? Uh, you know, I'm crippled, but I have 10 servants. Now, now one could argue that, um, you know, Marx doesn't go far enough in associating uh, these advantages, which he separates from the category of money, um, you know, uh, with uh, capitalism. I mean, Pierre Bourdieu remarks, for example, that in some sense, beauty is aleatory and genetic. In another sense, uh, you know, you do find that characteristically, the people who are deigned to be the most attractive come from the wealthiest places. Right? Why is whiteness valorized in terms of beauty across the world? Right? So there's still some kind of kind of connection there. Um, but what I want to stress is just that in terms of this naturalization of inequality, which is you know incoherently presented, I think, um, in the talk we watch, um, if you don't have this, Peterson's whole system 
uh, really falls apart. Yeah, and, and, right. I, and I, I should say too, like I think that yeah, I mean, and, and and that recognition of natural inequality, I mean, is like it's not just in the early stuff, the Paris manuscripts. It goes throughout uh, Marx's career in the uh, in uh, the um, in the first chapter of the Critique of the Gotha Program. You know, he he talks about how, in fact, one of his objections. Uh, to uh, the the Lasallians, this other faction in the German socialist mm-hmm. movement, saying that they're uh, everybody should uh, equally get the full product of their labor. First, he points out that that's you know inconsistent, right? If if it's if it's the full product of the labor everybody puts in, then it's not equal, right? You know, and, and then he says that this would actually just be a natural aristocracy because some people you know work harder than others, some people are stronger than others, some people are smarter than others, uh, mm-hmm. and um, so, so again, it's, it's something that I think he, he always has well honed recognition of, and uh, I would just have a quick shout out. So, uh, Peter Frey's wrote a book called Four Futures: Life After Capitalism," uh, which was originally a Jacobin article, then it was expanded into a short book. And I don't agree with Frey's about everything, but I mean, like, he's very good in this article in this book talking about this this subject of hierarchies, you know, because because his position, you know, what he says, and I think this is kind of seems to be what Marx thought is: look, nobody thinks that you're going to have a society without any hierarchy of any kind, even status, right? But the kinds of, and this goes to the Marx quote that you're talking about, Conrad, the kinds of status hierarchies that we would have in an uh, economically egalitarian society would be different and better because um, they wouldn't all be organized around the one central defining hierarchy of uh, money. Uh, that yep. they, uh, that be, you know, that's, you could, you know, look, if you can't, uh, you know, if you can't find recognition within one status hierarchy, it's a lot easier to find it in another uh, in a society where you don't have one that sort of tends to envelop all the others in its gravitational orbit. Uh, but yeah, and, and I do want to point out, by the way, you're, you're talking, uh, the first part of the talk was talking about the Rens and all that stuff, mm-hmm. just, just as a, like, it, it's honestly in a, in a way it's like the least of what's wrong with what he's saying but it's also uh worth pointing out that he that this the stuff about uh you know oh yeah homeless people sure you know they, they're poor but you know that's like one of 50 problems whatever uh and then he's kind of talking about his anecdotal impressions of you know homeless people he worked with as a uh, uh clinical psychiatrist um say, sorry clinical psychologist but he uh but there is actually empirical work on this. Like there, there mm. have been studies where, you know, where like there are different entities, local governments and stuff that have uh, given homeless people a place to live and financial support for like six months. And the, ev- the evidence seems to pretty clearly show that in fact, most, for most people that is enough for them to get their life together, you know, that they, they have that. Um, so, you know, this, this idea, I mean, that, um, that oh this is you know this is just a problem with uh, with personal character you know that mm-hmm. is, is what he's implying uh, is you know again just doesn't seem to be borne out empirically and it, and it's also we might, well, we might have to ask why those how those social pathologies are produced in the first place right right you know of course I'm not denying that they can happen to anyone right but I think that you know there's plenty of statistical data that indicates that you know things like drug problems alcohol problems are not independent right of social and material circumstances so there's already a fallacy. No, for, for, you know, for sure. Right. I mean, like, and, and there's a, and you can hold two thoughts in your head here, right. You can have, I mean, clearly, right. As Peterson himself shows, right. You can have these problems due to other causes without, you know, material deprivation. Uh, but, you know, it's also a little silly to pretend that it's like a coincidence that uh, they tend to spike at the same time as, economic crashes, you know, uh, mm-hmm. deindustrialization, you know, things like that, that, you know, that, that on a statistical level, you know, they, they do tend to be caused by that. But, uh, Marion, I uh, haven't, uh, you know, haven't heard from you. You know, I was just, uh, thinking of everything that you said, and I actually agree. Like to me, he has a very, like, uh, contradictory view of nature sometimes he says like no like as you mentioned right the whole lobster issue no like uh, like our orga- social organization should reflect nature on one on the one hand and at some other point he believes like in of course like he has a whole book on maps of meaning and how <laughs> important is like like to go like a cultural creations like to go beyond nature but, but i was going to say that uh 
one of the things that he also fails to me to to be kind of uh, uh, precise to is when he yeah when he speaks of inequality, difference, and hierarchy, right? Because just uh, and also as a feminist, right? The whole feminist issue is just because there's like a sexual difference that shouldn't mean there should be a hierarchy there, right? Which P Peterson fails to like acknowledge the fact that just uh, like certain differences given by nature are not just justifiable to maintain them as a social hierarchy, right? And um, and as you said, I, I was also thinking when you were mentioning, yeah, it, like certain uh, political projects don't advocate for the for erasing uh, hierarchies, uh, just the ones that, for example, are um, given by money. And I was just thinking, precisely on the whole idea of meritocracy and how talent and, and the idea of talent, right? And I think Peter's on fault, like he's very critical on his meritocratic view, right? It's like, oh no, like his whole problem with the quality of, of outcome that it's also so misguided too, right? But his whole issue is like, oh no, we, we want everyone to have the same talents. It's like, no, like JP, right? Like you can have different talents, just that talent should be, shouldn't be the only measure uh for your value and for the like the access to opportunities that you should have right and that's also like okay let's give him let, let's also let's take for granted the fact like okay talent is the measure because he loves to talk about talent right mm -hmm. most of the people that we think they are talented they are not even that talented right think about elon musk right he's not even the one behind the whole thing like he wants to get to mars and that's his idea right but he's not the one actually like making the scientific improvements to get there right like he hires the talented people but he he keeps the money right so which, which is i feel like a distinction that there would be that that somebody like peterson would have no trouble making in the context of a different social system uh like you know cuba uh, actually is is the is the uh, has like a lot of um, like uh, biotech you know that they they've, they've they've advanced in a lot in that in the last in the last several decades and a big part of the reason why is I think there was just a point in the 80s when you know Fidel Castro sort of decided that this is something that they'd be good at and that they should try to start to do and I I don't think that your Petersons or your, you know, like like any of these people, these these reactionaries who really valorize, uh, you know, entrepreneurs would say, oh my God, Fidel Castro is such a genius because you know because uh, because Cuba has these biotech developments. I think in that case, you'd be able to recognize, oh, the person making the decision, you know, is is not you know in the lab figuring out how to implement it, although. In Elon Musk's case, even the people in the lab usually aren't very good at it. I mean, I always think he's kind of like a, like a version of a James Bond villain, who's like, but the thing that was would lower him and you know would lower, uh, you know, Commander Bond into the you know the the um, into the pool with the sharks or whatever wouldn't actually work. You know, he'd like give a press conference about how amazing it was, but then it would like stall halfway down. Mm -hmm.